It's the Vancouver Hockey Show. Andrew Wadden, producer Aaron here with you once again as we have a short week for the Vancouver Canucks as we already unpacked that big win against the Vegas Golden Knights last Monday. Would have been a week ago now. But a couple of games this week. One not so good. One I think was quite impressive. So let's rewind the week as we do each and every week here. Go all the way back to Wednesday. A 4-3 overtime loss to the Desert Dogs, the Arizona Coyotes, at least for the time being. Who knew that that might have been the last time we saw that arena? Perhaps. I mean. Perhaps. I know our MXC highlights, they mentioned that as well. The old Vic and Kenny there. But you're right. It could be the last time that the Arizona Coyotes face off against the Vancouver Canucks. I want to get into the Coyotes and the relocation later on here in the pod, but let's just take a look at this game. A couple of things that I noticed. Arthur Seeloffs, he's a stick tapper. Do you know what I mean by that? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like Jack Campbell, you know, Jack Campbell loves every time he makes a save, he always has to, whoever's in front of him, give him a little tap, one of his teammates, a little, you know. I know what a does that as well. Also noticed, as I'm sure everybody else did, a Dylan Gunther continues to torch the Vancouver Canucks. And yes, we talked about the connection between Gunther and the Canucks and the fact that he was the pick that they moved to the Coyotes in the OEL and Connor Garland trade. And he's a youngster who looks really good right now in this league. He's got five points in three games in his career against the Canucks. And I was thinking about it, Aaron, where the Canucks are right now today, just looking at this season right now. And the fact that the Canucks are, you know, one of the contenders for the Stanley Cup this year. They're about to win the Pacific Division. Would you straight up be all right this year alone? Just thinking about this year alone, Connor Garland over Dylan Gunther. Ooh. Because think of everything that Connor Garland has done for the Canucks this year. And he's really surged in the second half. Yeah. He's up to you 19 put that, You goals. put that guy anywhere and he's doing something. And it's also, it's, it's, it's not just the counting stats with him, right? There's so many good things to like about what Connor Garland does on the ice. The fact that he goes to those greasy areas and he's what? Five, nine on a good day? 44 points in 80 games. Just doesn't jump off the page. I do love the 19 goals. Flirting with his career high, which is 22. Don't know if he's going to get there with just two games left in the season for the Canucks. But I'm just talking about right now, this year. And moving forward, obviously, Dylan Gunther, who knows where he's going to go in his career. And I, I don't think I'm going out on a limb saying that he's probably going to be a better point producer in the league than Connor Garland. But right now, for what you need, for what Garland is, I think you'd be okay with it. I think Canuck fans would be okay with it because what he brings to this team, we talked about it on the pod last week, just an absolute warrior in playoff mode already. And he just continues to do that. So, and the amazing duo with Joshua. Like, oh, yeah. Because Joshua was out of the lineup. Yeah. Now he's back and it's yeah. like, there's what was missing. Again, and, 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 and that's it right there, right? Like the chemistry, you know, like you can put Joshua with somebody else. He just doesn't have that chemistry. They've spoken about it. They're besties, those guys, right now. But I know moving forward, there's going to be the ties to Dylan Gunther to the Vancouver Canucks, and it's probably going to be a tough pill to swallow, you know, at some point, especially, you know, three, four, five years down the road here. But for what this is right now, I'm going to go to bat for it and say, hey, listen, I'll take Connor Garland over the youngster for this season alone. Down the road, yeah, that might sting a little bit. Now, the, the Canucks just, I mean, they fought to make it a game in that one, but it just seemed like the Coyotes needed it more. And there was all that that stuff swirling around the team with the relocation and I, I just yeah they, they were having a stressful week in Arizona oh, yeah. yeah like yeah but it sounds like too like because Andre Tourne their their head coach he spoke about the fact that when they originally sort of found out what was happening which was a few months ago that's really when they they went on their skid now you know some people might roll their eyes and be like yeah well I mean come on man. you're not that good of a team anyway but you can see how that would be a strain on a team, especially if you're a veteran or you know somebody that just signed up to basically live in you know Arizona for the next you know how however many years, right? So difficult situation. We will get to that in just a moment. Real estate's a little more expensive in uh, Utah, so uh... <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, though, a lot of people are kind of questioning Utah. I, I like uh, Salt Lake City, but let's talk about the Oilers first. That was a hell of a game. Oh, yeah. hell of a game. That was not on the radar this season at all that the Canucks would have the Oilers number for the whole season. The whole season. And, and you know, kind of 
crapped on the idea that, you know, they play them, they stack them up early and then they don't see them until late in the season, but they actually kind of created some good drama, right? Because and, let's also remember that three of those games, McDavid was on the ice. So yeah, no McD last night or on, on Saturday night, that is. So, you know, obviously you take the, you know, take Quinn Hughes out of the lineup for the Canucks. They're a much different team, right? But the Oilers are still good. Like a buddy of mine and, and I were talking about it and he's like, you know, what's the Oilers power play without, without McDavid 28th in the league. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. I still think it's a top 10 power play with it, with, without McDavid. Like they have so much firepower there. You know, I mean, dry settles, what top five player in the world. Like R and H had over a hundred points last year. Byman's got 50 goals. Uh, they got a bunch of, a couple of good defensemen in nurse and, and Bouchard. Bouchard's got that bomb, the boosh bomb. I hate that by the way, but in the game itself, the Canucks win three to one, very tidy win for the Canucks. DeSmith was really good in the first period. Mm -hmm. Check the analytics on it. High dangers at five on five were 10 to Oilers in the first period. Scoring chances were 13, six expected goals at 61%. So DeSmith did his depart. I don't know if that works, but he did his part. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't do But also, Skinner made some big saves. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're right. I, I, sign me up for a series against those two. Please. Yeah. Please. And make sure McD is there and healthy. I want everybody, you know, raring to go. Could be, you could, could happen. We'll see. But again, very tidy win for the Canucks. And look who scored the goals, Aaron. Lafferty, Suter, Joshua. You know, secondary scoring. Mm-hmm. You know, and you, you could look at the matchup game in, in that regard and what Kane scored the goal for the, for the Oilers. So you kept dry side, at least off the, I don't know if he was off the score sheet. Yeah, he didn't. He was off the score sheet entirely. It was Kane from Brown and nurse. So he kept their big, their big boys off the, the score sheet as well. Just a, like I said, just a very tidy win for the Canucks. So here's how it breaks down and double check the math for me. Cause I'm terrible at math. I'm talking about you, the listener, not you, Aaron. Yeah. Cause I can't help you there either. <laughs> Canucks need a point or an Oilers loss in any way to win the Pacific. And by the way, that's win the Pacific for the first time ever in franchise history. Don't come at me, bro. And I love the fact that my boy Drancer pointed it out on Twitter as well. And a bunch of people came at him. As you know, we did that video, at least, you know, Aaron, I don't know if the listener knows, but we did those videos for TikTok. And I talked about the fact that, you know, the Canucks, Though they're going to hang another banner, it looks like they're going to hang another division banner. Yeah, that's not the ultimate prize that they were going for. But in the video, I stated for the first time in franchise history, they'll win the Pacific. And boy, did I have a bunch of people jump down my throat. Some people calling it semantics. It's not semantics. It's a completely different division anyway. There's two it, new so teams fun. that didn't exist the last time the Canucks exactly. won. Exactly. So wrap your head around it, folks. It's not the first time they won the freaking division or a division. It's the first time they won the Pacific division. Gosh. The Smythe and the Northwest before, right? These, they've shuffled around. Regardless, I, I don't even know why I'm defending Division Banner, to be honest with you, because I don't think uh, that's the prize that they ultimately want to take. And the start to accomplishing that prize, of course, being the Stanley Cup, Lord Stanley's mug, starts in the first round. And it looks like, Aaron, as we record this, looks like it's going to be the Nashville Predators. Yeah. So again, asking you, the listener, maybe check the math for me here, but I believe the Preds need a point or a VGK loss in any way to lock up that first wild card. Now we are recording this on Sunday morning. The Avs play the Golden Knights Sunday afternoon at 1230. So much watch TV right Very there. Very good game. But I mean, at the same time too, the Masters is on as well. So I hope you got multi screens on Sunday to serve you well. But let's go over what we know about the Preds and the Canucks. The Canucks swept the season series, but the series was wrapped by Christmas. I think the last time they met, met twice in October, and then I believe it was like December 19th or something. But like, you know, teams are different. Yeah. Teams gel, as we've seen here. Yeah. And the, you know, trade deadline, all that stuff, right? So let's get to that then. In the last 20 games, so essentially since the All-Star break, the Preds are 13-4-3. That's the second best points percentage in the league since the All-Star break. Now, a lot of people love this guy's mustache, including myself, but not a lot of people talk about Philip Forsberg, it seems. When you got, you know, the MVP, the Hart Trophy race being what it is this year and, you know, Austin Matthews scoring what, well, closing in on 70 
goals and you got Kucherov and, and McDavid trying to get 100 assists and then the point totals that Kucherov and McKinnon are putting up. I mean, it's just, it's a big year for scoring right now, but flying completely under the radar because I know when I looked up the stats for the, the Preds, my eyes sort of popped out a bit. Phil Forster's got 47 goals this year, dude. He had 93 points in his last 20 games. Homeboy scored 18 goals. Like, and it's the big boys that are carrying them. Forsberg, as I just pointed out there. Roman Yossi, again, people talking about Hughes and McCarr, two horse race for the, for the Norris. I think you better get Yossi in there. 23 goals, 83 points. He's got 25 points in his last 20 games, which is the most by any defenseman over that stretch. So the Preds are for real. And this is not the Predators of pre-Christmas. This is a much different team. As you know, UC Saros, one of the best goalies in the NHL. I looked up his stats over this stretch as well. They're, they're good. They're not like what I just pointed out with Forsberg and, and Yossi. Like the big boys are definitely carrying them up front. And Yossi's holding the Ford as well. You gotta like that Preds team, though, man. So they're 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 not to be trifled with. Like this is going to be a tough first round for the Canucks. I know a lot of people. Are, oh, we gotta avoid VGK, and I don't disagree with that. But at the same time, too, you, you can't look past the Preds. This though is the guy that is going to help the Canucks if they are going to go anywhere in the postseason, and that's Thatcher Demko. Great news last week. Talked to the media. Said he's ready to go. He's feeling great. Coach just, I mean, I would love for somebody to look at me the way that Rick Tockett looks at Thatcher Demko. <laughs> yeah. Right? He just loves him. As he should. I mean, the stars of the league get all the, you know, get all the accolades. But, like, who ultimately wins you a Stanley Cup in the end? Like, it's usually, usually your goaltender. Very few teams can't ride a hot goalie. And what was Tockett's comments again, kind of earlier about Demko? It's like, oh yeah, guys will definitely block shots if they like you back there, right? Yeah. You know, like. <laughs> no, I, I, that, to be honest with you, Aaron, that was about to Smith. And it was because okay. he was talking about the backups and how like good backups, like backups with good reputations can have a long career in the league. Noodles, Jamie McLennan, one mm -hmm. of my favorite broadcasters nowadays. Noodles does a great job. He's one of those guys. Not saying that Noodles wasn't a good goaltender. But like everybody, there's, you're not going to hear anybody say something bad about him. On after hours, after the game, Calvin Picker, again, one of those guys, never going to hear anybody say anything bad about him. Now, don't get me wrong. They're going to be muttering under your breath that you're letting in stinkers, you know, mm -hmm. in those every few games you get to play. So you do have to do your part in that regard. But DeSmith is, is really well loved by his teammates. But again, let's get back to Thatcher. He's like a god in that dressing room right? Mm -hmm. Everybody says he's the best player on the team, and he is. And it was also nice to see him do that little sneaky around the corner there as uh, DeSmith was getting interviewed post-game and then comes up, give yeah. him a hug. Yeah, if you missed that, head over to our Instagram. I, oh, we put that up in our stories. Clip that a little bit with the, let me tell you about my best friend. Over I thought it was clever. Mm -hmm. So they're going to ease him in on Tuesday against the Flames, which... <laughs> At this point of the season, if you're one of the Flames, especially if you're like somebody who's, you know, got your contract, if you've got a job next year with the Flames, basically, and if you're Kadri or Coleman or, you know, Markey or any, any of those veterans that are on the team, like, you're probably, you know, booking your Expedia trips here in, you know, Mexico or Definitely Jamaica not refundable, or, save a few months. <laughs> yeah. Like, they're on the mind right now, right? They're on the mind. And, you know, for this, that team can't do anything else, really. So, uh, you know, maybe Calgary's state of mind will be a little bit different than the Canucks come Tuesday. So a good game to ease Thatcher in. But I mean, if you're Thatcher Demko, he would probably want to play, you know, the Dallas Stars in his first game. You know, yeah. Colorado, bring him, bring it on, bring on the best. Especially you know? Demko's record against Dallas. So Yeah, there you go. Thursday, though, in Winnipeg. Ooh. But the only thing about this, Aaron, is it could be a meaningless game for both sides. It could be. It could but, be. But, well, but yeah, but Winnipeg scored a touchdown and an extra point in Colorado the other night. So uh, that's an interesting game. I would like to go back and, and, and sort of rewatch that, I think, because I, I, those games are never, they never tell you the true story, right? Like, it's not like the Winnipeg Jets are that much better than the Colorado Avalanche. They're just on for one night only, the Avalanche laid an egg. Jets are hot right now, though. They're the winners of six in a row. But I think they're still trying to fight that home ice advantage, aren't they? So, Well, no. So I'm looking at it right now. And again, as we record this, 
Winnipeg is two points up on Colorado. They own the first tiebreaker and Colorado can't catch them in that regard. It's uh, regulation wins. They have three more than the Avs. The Avs only have two more games left. So they could catch them in the, in the, in the points race. But what is that? So they just, yeah. So Win- Winnipeg needs two points, basically, to lock it down in the next two games. So, yeah, because they can only top out at 108 for Colorado and, and Winnipeg's at 106. So, it, I, Aaron, I get the feeling it's going to be a meaningless game. R- regardless, we'll, you know, we'll see what, what happens in, in terms of lineups, but it'll be nice for Demko to get out on the road uh, and get another game under his belt. Which is nice that he gets to start at home and get one road yeah. game as well. Yeah, exactly. And that, uh, that they said that was the plan all along, which I found interesting. I thought maybe they would you know, want to give them that, 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 you know, big night in Saturday night in Edmonton. But at the same time too, I don't know about you. I think the Smith solidified himself as, you know, the go-to backup with that win against the Oilers. Exactly. I think there was a little bit of, you know, questioning in the market. And I actually think that Rick Tockett perhaps was thinking they, he, he was asked about carrying three goalies in the playoffs and he said it, it's a possibility, mm-hmm. but I think to Smith, he did his part there and it would be good. Like we talked about it on the pod last week. It would be good for a uh, sea loss to get uh, down to Abby and, and, and make a run in the playoffs for them. Okay. I want to get to some league stuff just because I found a few things interesting this week. One of them being the tie in. Uh, with the Coyotes, of course, that they're in town here and apparent relocation to Salt Lake City. But uh, let's start with the Golden Knights first, though, because this ties to the Canucks a a little bit closer. (laughs) As everybody knew was going to happen anyway, you know, Mark Stone returns to He has risen. Exactly. It's the Undertaker gif coming out of the casket. Like, LTIR is a good system in terms of, you know, when you need it to work for you, like the Canucks do with Tucker Pullman. Tucker Pullman physically can't play in the NHL anymore, right? So you have to find a way to be able to to solve his cap hit. But when you see two years in a row of Mark Stone just all of a sudden being ready right before the the postseason, Kucherov a few years ago as well, like that's when you start to call bullshit, right? And the league's got to do something about this because it's fine in the LTIR system. If the player is, you know, healthy in the playoffs and comes back in the playoffs, but when it's right before, like you're literally just taking the piss at that point. Right. And just giving the finger to the league and being like, oh, those are the rules. We're playing by them, but we're not really playing by them. So I can see why people would be pissed off about the Golden Knights and, and the way they're using the system. We'll see though, like Mark Stone, he's practicing in a non-contact, but he had a lacerated spleen as well. So it's a pretty easy injury for them to be like oh we don't know the timeline on this one like it's you know it's not like a high ankle sprain or something like that right like oh you just don't know but miraculously he's ready or looks to be ready for the first round that's not what i want to really talk about though with the golden knights because yeah we all call it and it's it is what it is but noah hannafin which i think i saw coming right from the time that they traded uh, to vegas Signs an eight-year extension with them. The AAV is at 7.35. Now, shoot, I think it was a few months ago, we talked about Heronic and, you know, the fact that you're hearing these numbers that the Heronic camp is looking for an AAV of 8 million, which is completely ridiculous. I'm sorry, but I don't care where the cap goes in terms of it rising and, and or when Quinn Hughes signed his deal. Philip Heronic should not be making more money than Quinn Hughes, period. But he also shouldn't be making more money than Noah Hannafin. Noah Hannafin's a better defenseman than Phil Peronic. So I know that I talked about Peronic being somewhere around $7 million, you know, if they're going to sign him to any sort of term. I believe Hannafin's a year older than, than Heronic. I'm not going anything higher than $7 million for Heronic. And you, you want to draw comparables? Well, there's one right there in Noah Hannafin. The Coyotes move into Salt Lake City. Aaron, I am completely down with. Mm-hmm. I am. You, first of all, it's got the right climate for a hockey city. You know, the market is, I mean, apparently it's thriving. It's one of the fastest growing cities in the States right now. People are moving there. And, you know, selfishly, as you know, I'm, I'm a snowboarder. They have an arena. Yeah, they got the rink. They got an a enthusiastic owner. But again, like I said, selfishly, I'm a snowboarder. Like, what a road trip for Canuck fans, right? You want to go down to SL, SLC? 
do some riding, catch a game. Now I looked it up because I thought, wait a second, is there a nonstop between Vancouver and Vegas? There's two a day. Well, Vegas, yes, but oh, sorry, did I say Vegas? I meant Salt Lake City. There's two a day at seven a.m. One's a Delta flight, the other's a WestJet flight. So you're kind of rolling the dice either way. Mm -hmm. Probably go WestJet, but again, seven a.m. flight. I I don't know. I think it would be. I think it looks be like there's more in the winter though. I just looked it up on Flight Connect and oh, there you go. Oh, even better. All right, so there you go. I was just looking up like recent. So I, I think it's going to work. I think it's going to work in Salt Lake City. I think it's a good city to have. NHL hockey in better than some of the other options they're talking about. Atlanta, you want to go back to Atlanta for a third time? And I know you can tell me all about the television market and all that stuff, but it hasn't worked twice in the past. What would make you want to go back there? Houston's intriguing, but again, you know, can we start playing in, you know, cities that have like actual winters, <laughs> right? Like Quebec City, which is complete pipe dream. And Gary's just, I don't know. I don't know if Quebec City's not sexy enough for Gary. I don't know what it is. But he ain't going to go there. And speaking of Gary, though, how greasy is the way this is going down right now? You've got the prospective owner of the, I think his name's Ryan Smith, of the Salt Lake, soon-to-be Salt Lake franchise, who is, like, out there tweeting about it. What, what should we call the team? This, like, homie, you don't even have the team yet. Like, it's, and Gary's fine with it. And if you remember back in the day, Jim Balsillie, who tried to bring a team to Hamilton, like he basically got his hand slapped and, and his prospects of getting a team pulled from him because he was running his mouth. But in this situation, it seems to be fine. And the, the really crappy thing about the whole thing is sure. As an NHL fan, you're probably going, well, about freaking time they got out of Arizona. They're playing in a college barn, but like, think of all the people that work for the organization. They're all not going to keep their jobs, right? There's good people, good hockey people that are, are, are now going to be without a job. So. There's the human element to the whole thing. But again, it's just so bush the way they're sort of going about it. But it's so Gary at the same time. Could you see that flying in the NFL? Oh, man. No I would way. say Major League Baseball, but I, we, I, I can see it flying in Major League Baseball. It's happening right it, now with the Oakland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The poor Oakland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think they even made a movie about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was, that was a positive movie, really. Now it's, a, now it's basically Major League unfolding. Like the movie Major League is, 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 is like unfolding in Oakland. And in fact, it's kind of happening in Arizona. They just waited until, what, game 80 to let the cat out the bag. Okay, let's put a bow on this one. Big week ahead, as we talked about. Tuesday at home versus the Flambinos. And Thatcher Demko returns to net. Looking really forward to that one. And then we'll see what Thursday is. We, it might, you know, like we said, it might be a meaningless game. Maybe some players will get rested. Maybe Thatcher might even get rested. I don't think it. I, I actually, as I say that out loud, that ain't happening. They want to get him the reps. So it'll be a week full of Demko. And then guess what, Aaron? Saturday, game on, baby. The playoffs start. We'll see what the Canucks schedule is. Haven't heard that just yet. Uh, we'll probably get that somewhere close to the end of the week, probably on Friday, I guess. I mean, it would be pretty intense in the city if it was a Saturday game, given that there is a annual non-sanctioned festival that usually happens. Yeah. That's right. Man, downtown would be buzzing for all sorts of yeah, reasons. Yeah, literally. A little more than, than usual as well. Yeah, it'd be interesting, though, because with them stopping on Thursday, with their last game being on Thursday, I wonder if they'll give them the extra day and they'll start on the Sunday. Selfishly, I don't want that to happen. I'm usually busy on Sundays, but we'll make it work. Hopefully the Canucks will make it work as well as they return to the postseason, Aaron, for the first time in forever. Postseason hockey. Let's go. Let's go. Who, hey, one last question. Who's going to have the best beard? Ooh, best playoff beard on the Canucks. I think that's a TikTok. Well, it won't be right Petey. There. It won't be Petey. Yeah, it's a good one. It won't be Petey. It's too patchy. Won't be Quinn be too patchy although I, i'm very curious to see how those guys come in jt is kind of patchy as well it's, I, I think it, it might be garland or uh Heronic. i want to see yeah Heronic should shave it down and same with is that your rocking one right now i think he has a stash i put up a video of him the other day i should know this. <laughs> i don't know i'm gonna go with Heronic. i think Heronic could probably get the he's like a like a viking like a like a czech viking <laughs> right yeah I'm going to go with Heronic, but I'm, I'm going to say who's, who's going to be the worst. Yeah. I think it's going to be between Quinn and, and, and Elias Pettersson. We'll keep, we'll keep an eye on that though. They should all shave too, like clean shave 
rate for game one and then let her go after that. You can't, you can't cheat. You can't go into it with one already. No. Right. No. And you got to shave at five o'clock. <laughs> well, what about you and me? Are we going to the guy? I always have this, like, I call it the George Michael. Should yeah, we do no, it as well? I, uh, uh, I got lazy days, but I mean, like, <laughs> you're kind of patchy too. I beat you. I, I think, I, I, think yeah. I would. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Yep. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. We'll be back again next week.